So the first thing I want to do is talk about the history of the I formation. And I think that this is interesting. It's not one that I'm particularly familiar with. And it's uh, luckily, uh, luckily the book that I've used on a lot of the history of some of these offensive uh, and defensive schemes, as I've talked about them on the podcast, luckily there is a book and it is fantastic. And it is Blood, Sweat, and Chalk from Sports Illustrated. Uh, I definitely think you should check out Blood, Sweat, and Chalk. And I'll put a link down below. Uh, or in the show notes at joedanielfootball.com slash 2019proi, okay, 2019proi. And as I go through this, it's also important to point out, if you're interested in defending this, I have a manual called Defending the Pro-I Offense in the 425 Defense, and that has all the run fits for these base plays uh, that you're going to see in the Pro-I Offense. And basically what it is is the diagrams drawn up, the key reads for each position, how they fit those runs uh, it's a couple of years old, so a few things have changed within the 425 system, but for the most part, it's going to show you the run fits and the reads and how to fit each one of these. But Blood, Sweat, and Chalk is a fantastic resource, uh, easily available, so definitely one. If you like football coaching, the history of the plays, even if you're not a coach, uh, I think it's a really valuable resource just to go back and look to see. But a couple of things about this, and I'm not going to get it uh, all perfect, um, so it goes back to 1950, and we start with Tom Nugent. Okay, Tom Nugent was in his fourth year as a head coach at Florida State. Bobby Bowden is going to visit him. Bobby Bowden's in his first year uh, as a coach at South Georgia College. Okay, so this is 1949. Um, sorry, 1949, Nugent had taken over and started running it. I think this is 1956 when Bowden is starting coaching. Okay. So Bowden's first year, and he's going to go down to Tallahassee, and he's going to study uh, Tom Nugent, who is at Florida State, his fourth year there, and he is running the I. Uh, well, he is running what would kind of evolve into the I formation. So where the I formation started, uh, it says Nugent's second season was one of the most unusual in VMI's gridiron history. Uh it started with a high note of success, a 25-19 night game win over William and Mary in Roanoke, the first loss by William and Mary to a Virginia team in 10 years, and a contributing factor was Nugent's unveiling of the I formation, its first use in college football. Okay, so VMI, uh, first use in college football at least, and obviously there's too many high schools to know exactly where something came from if it was run at a high school level for the most part. Um, if you know that information, great, love to hear it, but just almost no way to know. Um so VMI against William and Mary in Roanoke. I don't know why it's in Roanoke, but I'm in, I live in Virginia. So I know the, 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 uh, the locations of everything. I guess Lexington's not too far. So VMI 1950 college level, Tom Nugent runs the I formation for the first time. Now what's important to note about that I formation was it was Bobby Bowden. This is a quote from Bobby Bowden. He says he was running the pure eye formation with all four backs, including the quarterback, in a straight line. Okay, so that's not the pro eye that we're going to be talking about. What we're what uh, Tom Nugent was running is what I would call the Maryland eye. Okay, some I've heard it called the stacked eye. I've heard some different names for it. Uh, but what what that's being how that's being run in 1950 is not the I formation as we know it today. How it was being run in 1950 with Tom Nugent was actually what we would call the Maryland I. Okay, and so it's or there's a number of different terms that you can use a stacked I, but all three backs, all four backs, quarterback. Um, the fullback, whatever you call the next guy, I don't know, it would be a fullback, a halfback, and a tailback. Maybe that's maybe that's it. Uh, so those guys are in a straight line. Uh, and I've seen this run some, but nobody split out. And just to continue on, he says, Tom gave us the playbook. I still remember it today. The off-tackle play was called the blast, and the outside play was called the roll. And then they had a play-action pass off of both of them. That's, look, 
that's a playbook. You guys that are coaching youth, you're coaching high school, especially at uh, smaller high schools. You know, we're not getting into the, you know, year round six A tech. I don't know how Texas rigs, but the, whatever the highest level in Texas or Florida or something like that is. You guys that aren't coaching at that level, that's a viable offense. Okay, is this the best offense to run? Probably not, but it's a viable offense. We'll talk about it when it could be the best offense. Not necessarily the Maryland eye, but. Um, and, and Bowden says later on in the same page, back in those days, there wasn't a whole lot of imagination. I mean, I guess not, but you know, if nobody would ever done it, it's pretty imaginative, right? Um, the I, and just to say the I formation was a power offense with slightly more deception than the T with the I offenses could run a power off tackle play by sending the lead back one way for a fake and still have it back as a lead blocker at the point of attack. Now, what you don't get in the Maryland eye, obviously you have a very limited passing game, very limited. All right. Um, you know, a couple play actions basically. So where we start to evolve from that is, is going to be guys like Bowden who want to open up the passing game. Uh, so Bowden goes on he coaches, uh, became the head coach at, at, uh, Samford 1959, uh, it was called Howard at the time, but Samford 1959 switched to the wing T by the time he landed in West Virginia in 1966, he was wearing a pro set I formation. And again, that's what I would call this is, uh, or what I would call the offense, or what, what I refer to it as, is the pro I formation. And so now we're getting into more like the formation wise, what we're going to be talking about in this podcast. So Bowden is going to be running. So it says, by the time he landed in West Virginia in 1966, he was running a pro-set I formation with two backs behind the quarterback. And it would remain the foundation of, Bowden, of the Bowden offense for more than three decades and was called the multiple I. Okay, so up into the late 90s, uh, I guess, I mean, I, I don't know what Bobby ever really, I say Bobby like we're friends. I don't know if he ever really changed it, you know, or at least got away from it. But the pro-I is the formation that, and and essentially the offense that we're talking about in this episode. Okay, so this is we this is we've gotten to it in 1966. Um, and he said Bowden says you never call, can tell who invented anything, but it wouldn't surprise me if Tom Nugent invented invented that thing. So okay, we can credit Tom Nugent. That's fine. Tom, you know nobody's going to argue. Um, who's going to argue with Bobby Bowden anyway? So. That's basically where we're at. And we get into some different things with Coriel. Um, but then eventually we land on uh, USC. Okay. And so the important thing here is USC, John Robinson, McKay. Um, I think what McKay kind of credits, uh, or excuse me, John Robinson kind of credits John McKay at USC uh, in 1960 as being, being the one who kind of implemented this in 1960. And he said, he, he talks about, uh, there being some high school coaches in the area or a high school that was running it and McKay really liked it and he introduced it. But John Robinson is where we're going to focus as far as the history here. Um, and we've got the offense now. Okay. The offense is essentially going to be, uh, we'll talk about the offensive plays. I want to talk about the personnel. So if you're not interested in the history, don't skip forward. Okay. You want to know the personnel that we want to have for this I formation offense. Okay. So the, the important thing here is that there is a possibility that you have the right personnel, the perfect personnel to run the I formation. Now, in my opinion, which actually has some validity because I, I work with a lot of different teams, Running the I formation solely as your base offense. And if you agree that these are the players that you need to be successful in the I, as I go through this, we're going to go through three points. We're going to say, here's what we need at the running back. Uh, here's what we need at the fullback. So four points, actually. The running back, the fullback, uh, the offensive line. But I'm going to kind of incorporate the fullback with the offensive line. Um the quarterback to an extent, okay, although he's not nearly as important, but really let's talk offensive line and your tailback, okay? If you agree with these points, then the I formation may be perfect for you right now as you see it on your team. But 
if you're a high school or even a youth coach, it is unlikely that you can guarantee having these particular players year in and year out. So what I would advocate is if this absolutely fits you, I would incorporate, I would run something like the pistol power offense system and incorporate a lot more eye formation. I mentioned that this year I didn't run, or this past 2018, my last season coaching, I didn't coach this year, so uh, it's, that's what throws me off, um, was one of the first seasons in the pistol power offense that I did not use any eye formation at all. And that's because I didn't, we probably had the guy or guys to use the I formation. I mean, one thing was we didn't need it. We averaged 42 points a game, I think. So we didn't need it. Um, and I usually don't, you know, I don't expand the playbook just to expand the playbook. But I didn't see an advantage to it. Usually it's because we've got an extra bruiser, offensive lineman type of guy that can be that fullback and maybe has the athleticism to leak out into the flat or something like that. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about it now. I definitely had the guy, but a couple of them, but um, we just didn't use it. But the thing about it is while the eye might've worked on that team, being in the pistol power offense system would allow me or any system, any system has the ability to do this. A good system would allow me to line up in the eye within our system, but then say next year, the guys that are critical to this offense are gone. I can still stay within the system and run something that is fitting to our players. So in other words, you don't change your system every year, but your system should adapt to the players that you have. And that's the critical thing. And that's why I think the pistol power offense system is fantastic. Uh, I think it is the answer to almost everybody. Uh, who has an offense because you just you, you can adapt it um, and I know how to do it. So it's not to say this is the only thing. Like, do I think Air Raid's garbage? No. Okay. Do I think Wing T is great? Yes. Fantastic. Do I love Double Wing? I love it. All right. But I think the Pistol Power Offense system, if if it speaks to you, is is, is money for you. So we have the ability to run the eyes. So let's talk about the personnel. If you want to be an eye formation heavy team. Uh, and this comes from Robinson. He says, number one, you're going to have you're going to have a tailback that you really feature. And McKay wanted to develop one player. He's talking about John McKay, who really dominated the scene. You were going to give him the ball 30 times a game. Hell, I wanted to give it to Ricky, and he's talking about Ricky Bell. I wanted to give it to Ricky 50, or I gave it to Ricky 53 times in one game. People wanted to kill me, and then it points out that Bell only carried. 51 times for 347 yards and a 23-14 win over Washington State in 1976. By the way, if you do the math on that, um, keep giving him the ball. Like, you know, 51 times, what's that, six, over six yards, almost seven yards a carry. Yeah, you know. Uh, it's brutal. Hopefully you don't lose him for the next game, but that's pretty good. Robinson continued... Then McKay worked really hard on getting the best offensive lineman and really physical offensive lineman. The goal was to physically dominate the defense, control the line of scrimmage, and feature the tailback. So, we need a physically gifted feature tailback. The guy that you want the ball in his hands 35 times. So, Here's the thing in in modern football with modern football players. One guy is getting featured, and if you're running say 55 offensive snaps, it's just as a number, and you're going to feature this back 30 times. That leaves 25 snaps to be distributed over everyone else. So let's say we have 10 passes. Okay, that leaves 15 snaps. To be distributed over everyone else. Maybe you've got a quarterback uh, keep, a quarterback sneak, a draw, something like that. A sprint draw type of play. Okay, so three or four carries are going to the quarterback. 
You're probably running an inside trap, which I didn't even mention because I'm focused on featuring the running back, but you could run an inside trap. Great play. I would probably definitely feature that in the offense. In fact, let's add that in as we go through. The playbook's already expanding, and I don't even run this offense. Um, feature an inside trap. You know, maybe you get something like a, a sweep, a jet sweep, something like that. Maybe you incorporate that in your offense. But, you know, gosh. And, and maybe you run the same plays with another guy five or six times, right? Somebody else gets some touches. But really, the touches are going to be limited. And you're going to want to get other touches for somebody else because your offense is featuring one back. And if he goes down, you better have somebody else who can come in there and carry the ball. Um, so maybe saying we have a feature tailback is wrong because if we have just one feature tailback, like, what do we do if we're down one? Um, you might need two feature tailbacks. Which they had, by the way, because uh, in some of the mentions, I don't think I'm going to get to it, but they mentioned that the fullback uh, in one instance, I think they won the national title in 1979, I believe. Uh, the, tail, the fullback was Marcus Allen. He was like 185 pounds, but he was just too good to keep off the field. And I think Bell was the, was the um, tailback. So, like... I think you probably, in my in my mind, I want that fullback to be more of like a guard type of player. But if you're running the offense, um, see, this is where, where Marcus Allen comes in is where I say, if that was the situation, I would rather be in the pistol power offense system where Marcus Allen is my H-back and I can get into a pro zero formation, but I can also move him around. And again, check it out, pistolpoweroffense.com. Uh, you want to get a free video series on the power counter and power pass, pistolpoweroffense.com slash podcast uh, to check that out. So um, he also mentions the quarterback, a smart quarterback who could manage the game and throw individual routes when the defense singled wide receivers. I think that's kind of the feature here. Your passing game is going to be primarily play action, uh, but if you have a dynamic receiver, you know, you get one-on-ones on the outside, you throw fades. If they're going to play off, you could throw hitches. Um, you could throw quick game looks, but a lot of play action, probably maybe some sprint outs and that is going to help your sprint draw and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, in the, in the foundations of the offense, we're probably looking at your basic, um, play action, waggle power pass, maybe type of plays. And in fact, uh, while the toss sweep became the, uh, was to become the most famous of USC's power running plays, again from Blood, Sweat, and Chalk. It was one of four base calls. The others were isolation or, in coach speak, ISO. Yes. Um, very few coaches are going to call it the isolation play. The other uh, the others were isolation, power strong, and power weak. On the isolation call, the tailback ran straight over the middle of the offensive line with a double team block on the nose. And a um, and most teams, I think, were running 50 fronts at this time. And fullback leading, uh, and in you know in the next decade the fork three would become much more popular at the college level. Power strong was an off tackle play to the tight end side. Power weak, fullback lead play away from the tight end side. It was an offense you could draw up real simply. Uh, said Munoz, that was Anthony Munoz, uh, offensive lineman, but it required real tough, effective man to man blocking by the tackle and tight end on the play side. I'm going to disagree with that. I mean, I, not the way that we run our power. We wouldn't be. I guess it depends on the alignment, maybe. But and I did. I mean, I, I watched a bunch of clips. I didn't go back and watch much USC from this period. Um, but I watched different offensive clips, and I see some of that. I see a lot of that. But um, you know, I don't think you have to block it that way. So, so personnel, a a powerful offensive line, and that that offensive line is more on your sweep play. I think your power, you can run it with your gap scheme. Uh, your sweep play, you definitely want to be able to get out there and kind of run some people over in the alleys. Uh, but quickness is is key there as well. So I think it's important to note that while this was, and this has been successful a lot of places, but I will say that the places that it's been successful probably had a really good tailback. Um the ISO, you definitely want to be able to bruise people up front. You know, you get that combo. You really want to be able to, to hammer some people. And and maybe maybe a 50 front ISO is where, you know, your tight end and your and your 
tackle really need that strong base block because you're going to combo the nose and iso the backer. So yeah, I could see that. The power is not as important because I'm going to kick the end uh, in a 50 front or 3-4 outside backer. I'm going to kick him out. Um, not base block him. So the ISO though, yeah, I could see that. You got to scoop, the, you got to scoop out a uh, a four tech. That could be tough. All right, so let's get into the base plays of our I formation package. We've already talked about them quite a bit, so we'll just jump in and start drawing them up. Um, you know, I don't see a lot of fifty front, I and mean, we see three four, but well, I did see a lot of fifty front actually, but um, you know, I think from a standpoint of do you want to see this. With the three four, do you want to see it as an I formate as a? Um, do you want to see it against a forty front, a fifty front? It just depends. You know, is it better against one than the other? No, not necessarily. Uh, you just got to know where to run your play. So in the pistol power offense system, we talk about red side, which is reduction, and white side, which is wider. Um, so basically, is the B gap open or closed? You want to run certain plays to an open B gap. You want to run certain plays. Uh, to to a closed B gap. So power is a great play to a closed B gap, like a three technique. ISO is a great play to an open B gap. Um, so you might run ISO to the weak side, power to the strong side. Uh, you might run counter to the weak side just because you run power to the wrong side, well, strong side. It doesn't mean it's the only place that you run it, but your blocking wise, you know, you get a better look out there with it. So against a 50 front, let's start off with the sweep. And really, a th you know, we're going to do a 30 front because who runs a 50? Anyway. The sweep, the important thing on the sweep, on the ISO sweep, is how you're going to block it and how you're going to handle. A lot of people just say, well, it's student body right. Everybody run to the right. Well, no, there's a lot more to it than that. You've got to talk about how are you going to handle uh, the force? What are you going to do with the receiver? All these kinds of things. The way that it was run, and I'm not positive this is right or wrong, but the way that it was being run by John Robinson, the way that it was being run by USC, was that you were pulling both guards out there. And the Blood, Sweat, and Shock talks about the difference between the Lombardi sweep in which the backside guard was pulling and he was going to get out there and lead for the tailback, for the running back, uh, ball carrier to whereas in the um, in the in the USC version, the student body right, student body left version in the I formation, the backside puller was just going to be looking for run through basically, rather than trying to get out in front. And the reason behind that is that in the Packer sweep, the ball was actually being handed to the running back. To whereas in the USC in the I formation in the Pro I sweep. The ball is being tossed. Now the toss, because we're featuring a, a spectacular running back, the toss, I think, is a much better way to do this. Now within the pistol power offense system, we do not run sweep this way. We run inside and outside zone, which you can obviously run out of the I formation, run the outside zone, and we run truck toss. But you can certainly incorporate this into, into your offense if you were going to be an I formation offense. So while I talk about this being the first play, um, I would probably lean toward, if you're a pistol power offense team, just running truck toss. Truck toss is going to be uh, bringing the outside receiver down uh, to, to handle the safety. It's going to be pulling the tackle. He's going to horn pull out to kick the cornerback out. Okay, And so this is going to be a much wider type of play. Uh, it's going to mean that the... Um, tight end has to handle the number two and that the H back is going to need to handle the number three. The I, the, the I back, the fullback is going to need to handle the number three so that we get out to the edge. And, uh, what that count system is, is we count the first player, the, the, basically it's the A gap defender or a head up nose on the call side is zero, uh, in the zone scheme. That's who the center is responsible for guard is responsible for one, um, and the um, tackle is responsible for two, and the tight end is responsible for three. Uh, you're going to need the the H back to seal the edge and handle the three because you're going to need 
the why to at least chip the two, unless you think you can cut him off with a guard. Um, so, you know, that's probably what I would do uh, is just run the truck toss. If I were just incorporating it into our pistol power offense system, but if you're going to go full bore, full out, and you're going to be, you know, an I formation team and you want to do it the way that they were doing it back in the day. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pull the guard and the front side guard is going to usually end up kicking out the force defender. Okay. He's going to usually end up kicking out the force defender and the receiver can go and stalk the safety because I don't care about the corner. Now, if the corner's a really good tackler, then you might want to block the corner to sock block the corner. But most of the time we don't block the corner. And when we get to the play action, I'll tell you where that's really going to pay off dividends for you. Because you're tossing the ball, you're, you're almost completely unconcerned about anybody basically back B-gap back uh, disrupting this play. You're really not concerned. So you're, you're really looking for the center um, to cut off at least the nose. But if he gets across his face, you don't think there's any way that he's going to run down that play. He can climb to the next level. You're pulling the backside guard. So he's looking for basically open windows, um, any run through, any backers trying to like, for example, if you get a linebacker trying to replace where the guard pulled, um, and this is where, this is not a play that I run. It's not a play in our system. So I don't know exactly. And this was one of the things in my research that I really had a hard time finding was exactly how you adjust to the different fronts. So if somebody out there is a big time, uh, student body type of power sweep runner, uh, I'd love to hear from you and how you block it. But basically, kick out with the front side guard. Um, everybody else is essentially reaching. The The fullback is going to be leading the alley um, and probably looking for free safety or looking for whatever shows up, first thing that shows. And then the R is catching the ball in the toss. And kind of like Buck Sweep, he's getting outside really fast. If the force player were to crash and collapse, then you probably want to end up logging him. But assuming that he tries to keep his force... You really want to get as wide as he'll let you go and then cut right inside off of the kickout block by the front side guard. Uh, and that's going to be your best path to, uh, to, to getting that. And it's basically an alley type of run. Okay, So it's not off tackle. It's more trying to run in the alley. You're trying to reach everybody in the box. You're trying to kick the, um, kick the force defender and you're trying to lead up on the free safety and handle him. And you got those backside guys trying to cut off any backside pursuit. So that's the basics of your sweep against a balanced front, like a 50 or like a, like a three, four. Um, if the safeties aren't rotated, it's probably not a good play to run to the weak side. Although I do think if you brought the tight end uh, down, it might be a good play to get out there on the, on the perimeter to this, to the, um, single back if you're working with a rotated uh secondary where they're rotating down to your tight end side now numbers are a little bit more in your favor might be something where you can uh get out there and have some success with it though i just don't know if the perimeter you know it's i guess it's something you kind of try it out and, and see if you like it see if it works for you but you can, you can run it weak, and obviously you can bring in a tight end over there, and I think the numbers work out really well if you go to a two tight end type of formation. So the power sweep, or as it was called, the student body right, student body left, you can definitely use that. You can incorporate those pulls with your zone principles. I know we have uh, coaches who are in the pistol power offense system who do pull the guards. I have messed around with pulling the guards at times as well, um, on the both, both on – uh, outside zone, pulling the backside guard, but also um, on um, the truck toss, pulling the backside guard as well. I haven't done it with the front side guard, but some guys, I've done some different things with the front side guard, more like a power type of play, but, um, and you could run like a G power out of this where you kick out. This is just, you got so many options. Any, any formation, this is a simple formation. Um, you've got so many options. You know, I like the, the versatility of the H back, but the part of the versatility in the pistol power offense system of the H back is I can put it in the eye and it's just pro zero. It's no problem. It's part of a formation, it's part of a package. So the next play is power. 
or excuse me, is ISO. Let's start with ISO. So in the ISO play, again, this is a white side play, meaning that you want an open B gap. So if you've got a 3-4, both sides are white. Um, that's no problem. If you've got a 4-2-5, 4-4 type of defense or a 4-3, then only the weak side is white. So it's a weak side ISO, which if you run a 4-3 uh, or you run a 4-2-5, that is where teams that are in an I formation are going to try to hit you is with the weak side ISO without any question. But um, still working against that uh, 50 front or 30 front. The ISO is going to let you combo on the nose, but you are going to have, as I mentioned, you are going to have that base block now with the tackle on the, the defensive end, the four technique over top of him. And he's going to have to win that base block, little scoop block there in order for you to get to win the play. Easier for the tight end. He's just got to get inside. And what I see a lot of teams doing is, especially if you get aggressive outside rushers, is you can kind of step inside and open up the door and let those guys block themselves. So it's not as much of a, I got to get on him and base block him and drive him. Okay. If I can just get him to, um, if I can just get him to kind of uh, rush up the field on his own, then I don't have to do much. You know, I've just got to turn him out. So I can kind of step inside, open up the door where I open my outside shoulder the way that I would never want to do it on a pass rush. And if he invites himself up the field or invite him up the field, and if he takes that invitation, then, uh, you know, we're off to the races. Backside, again, with the ISO, it's quick hitting. So you don't have to worry too much about, you know, getting good base blocks. You can just run cutoffs on the backside with the ISO because this is not a play where we are looking to fool anybody. It is a power run game. You want to be pretty close to the line of scrimmage, you know, six yards for the for the R, um, four yards maybe for the H because we don't want to make these guys stay in their blocks for very long. Um, we want that double team to dominate, but everybody else only have basically – you know, one man uh, to block. And then I've always used actually play action. I've always used the quarterback to set up, um, you know, coming straight back, just like we would on inside zone, no no reverse pivot. He gives the handoff and then setting up uh, because what I like off of an ISO, because we really draw up those inside linebackers, what I like off of that is a seam route or a tight end pop pass as the play action off of that. So um, I really like that. It's That's the play action I use off of inside zone too. Uh, with the H back and the Y running the seams. In this case, you probably need to be in double tight for the seams, but you can get the little quick tight end pop pass um, or maybe just have an, an option for a fade on the outside as a play action off of the ISO if you wanted to. I also got a really, really good uh, ISO. Um, I think, you, you know, you leak. When you run the ISO weak, if you leak that fullback out into the flat off of the play fake, he gets open a lot. Um, a lot. So if you run an ISO week against a 40 front, that's a great play fake to use um, and get the ISO week out there or get the ISO week fake and then play action. So ISO great play basic. Um, I've got YouTube videos. If you go to my YouTube channel, I've got videos on running the ISO as well. I've run the ISO in the pistol within our pistol power offense system. When I've had basically what I've done is taken like those defensive minded kids, like, like a big, bruising defensive lineman who's a good athlete put him at fullback and this would be like a short yardage type of package put another crazy kid at tailback who can carry the ball he's not going to carry it 30 times but we just got into this formation with two crazy kids um the type of kids that you know as i talked about before um crazy kids are great you know it's like it goes back to the the guys who are always like my well, kids aren't aggressive enough uh, why can't everybody just go in there and throw their body at other humans like like with absolute disregard? Those kids are great to have. It's awesome to have one or two of them. They're fun to coach. It's best for society if you if there aren't a lot of them. Uh, and so if I've got one or two of those guys, they're like too crazy to be. A lot of times those guys are too nuts to be consistent def, uh, offensive players, and they play so hard on defense that they their bodies are just you know. They need a recovery, but I can put them in for a couple of plays in short yardage, get them maybe a little short yardage uh, carry here and there, and, and change a tempo, change of change of attitude, uh, and and really only teach. You know, I'm not having to teach the H back how to run an ISO block because it's not something he does. I'm just only teaching this one crazy kid how to how to ISO block, and the other kid how to run straight ahead. He's not going to run a toss, right? He's, we're not running a toss with him. We might have a play action or something. We're running an ISO, maybe an inside trap. So. You know, that's um, that's how I've used it, but that would be the second play. Um, and for me, in an I formation, again, going back to what we said, 
this is probably my favorite play in it, if I'm going to be a pure I formation team. This is probably my favorite play with the toss being the second. Um, if I've got that, again, the, the caveat to that is I have big bruising offensive linemen. I have a bruising fullback. I have a feature tailback. Feature. Not a good tailback. A feature tailback. Um, you know, the toss is good, but to me, the toss, one one mistake is more likely. You know, if that, if that OLB gets up the field on me, I think he can he can wreck my world. Now the guard should kick him out. I just got to cut it a little sooner, but I could see him kind of screwing my life up there to whereas the ISO and especially the power encounter. Um, but if the, in the, but the ISO, if I can just kick the snot out of you up front, the power encounter, if I've got a little less of a dominant offensive line, um, the power, especially the counter is going to base, you know, base off what they do. So, um, I like the ISO a lot. I think it's a good play. It's not a part of my package normally, but I like it. All right, so then we go to the power. It's vanilla power. And this the purpose of this podcast is not to teach power. So if you want to know how we block power and the rules, join the Pistol Power Offense system, $19 a month. You get full access. Go to pistolpoweroffense.com. And again, I've got a free video series at pistolpoweroffense.com slash podcast. If you want to just see the rules of the power counter and the power pass, it's a three video series at no cost to you at pistolpoweroffense.com slash podcast. So um, power, the H-back or the fullback is now taking the role of the H-back. Um, the only thing is if, if we're doing it against a 50 front or a 30 front, uh, I tell that guard to pull to the open window. Uh, so if he sees open space against a 30 front, he may end up pulling up an A gap as to where we normally wouldn't. But I've talked so much about power. I think it's, you know, such a good play. I would, um, there's not a whole lot to say about it other than I'll just mention the blocking that we do, which is uh, the blocking rules are the center always blocks back. The play side guard and play side tackle and play side tight end. The rule is if the center is covered and the guard is not, then we are going to have a combo between the tackle and tight end. Okay, If the center is covered and the guard is not, then the tackle and tight end are going to combo. Uh, usually a four technique, maybe a five technique, and the guard blocks back, down blocks the center, but down blocks the nose. If the guard is covered and the center is not, then the guard and the tackle are going to have a combo on the guy covering the guard, and we're going to kick out the five or the nine or whatever it is out over the tight end. If the center and the guard are covered, or when in doubt, we make a down down call. We just down block everybody. Okay. We kick out the first man on or outside of the tight end. All right, we kick out the first man on or outside of the tight end, uh, whether he's a seven, a six, or a nine, a six I, a six, or a nine, whatever words that you use. Okay, we kick him out. The backside guard wraps to the front side linebacker. We use a skip pull. It's not special, it's not fancy, and it's not hard. Um, We use a um, backside hinge by the tackle. So he's going to cut off anybody trying to come through B gap where that uh, center or where that guard is leaving. And then we tell both receivers, go block the safeties because screw the corners, they're corners for a reason. And it is not their excellent tackling ability. If they're great tacklers, we may adjust that. But for the most part, they're not. Um, The quarterback reverse pivots. The R uh, running back takes a counter step an opposite direction that we're going and then steps back over. The quarterback reverse pivots, hands the ball off. Boom, we follow the guard up through there, and the quarterback carries out a power pass path, opening up to the front side and looking like he's going to throw the ball down the field. So we always try to get him snap his eyes around and look down the field with the ball with his hands on his hip as long as he can. So 
Um, base power play. Power week is the same rules, the same idea, um, except for you don't have a tight end, so you end up kicking out a four technique. Okay, we, we, we will end up kicking out the guy head up or outside of the tackle most of the time. But we usually don't run power to a... Um, we usually don't run power to the open side, to the side without a tight end. So we could either bring in another tight end uh, or we can then go and um, run the counter play. So we run tend to run a lot of power to the strong side, counter to the weak side. And again, it's be- partly because 40 front power is a red side play. So we want to run it preferably against 40 fronts. So we run around power to the three tech side. We want to run counter, which is more of a white side play, but it doesn't have to be. We run around counter more to the um, to the open B gap, okay, to the weak side. So the counter play, um, you can run the counter play. Uh, power week, actually, power week would essentially be your, you know, that's essentially power week is going to need to be in in this scenario, probably your GT counter because it just doesn't give you the same, you know, you can run, you can run power week, but counter is really going to need to be your GT counter. A lot of the same rules will apply, but I'm not going to get the combos and I'm going to depend on them keying on that H back. Okay. And this is the same rule that we use when we're running it uh, with, with the H back moving around in our power counter uh, that you see in those videos at pistolpoweroffense.com slash podcast, the same basic rules, except that as far as play calling is that once your attention is now set on that H back being the key, now I'm going to make the H back a false key. So what I would do on this play is use the H back to fill for the pulling tackle because we don't have a hinge block form. So really pull, filling for the pulling guard or maybe off the hip of the pulling guard, uh, like out of three technique, even though we're going to block back on him, I can hinge the tight end or I could release him. If I think it's going to do something for me, I could arc release him. Um, but that counter step now becomes even more important with the R he's going to counter step. The quarterback is going to reverse pivot. And what we're going to get is, um, again, a combo. If we had a three technique with the guard covered, but running it away from the tight end, we're going to end up kicking out anybody head up or outside of the tackle. So we're going to, if we're working against our 30 front, uh, we'd end up kicking out a four tech. If we were working against a 40 front. Uh, we would end up kicking out a five tech with the pulling guard. So we're going to get a down block. Uh, the center's going to block back. Always his rule here. The guard is going to block back on the nose. What we tell the tackle to do is to step down, especially if it's a two eye, um, to step down and scrape paint with that guard and make sure that we don't get a spark by the nose coming over the top and then carry on to the backside linebacker. Um, so he's going to account for the backside linebacker. The backside guard is going to kick out pull on the four or five technique, depending on the front that you're seeing, uh, but kick out the end man. All right. The backside tackle is going to wrap to the front side linebacker. And again, uh, hinge by the, by the Y, the H is replacing, filling in that gap where they left. We're hoping to get some backfield flow, backer flow, uh, that direction. And then, we are going to carry this out uh, with the R running inside. Stay tight. You may be worried about the the outside linebacker, whether it's a weak safety or will back or whatever it is, folding in. If he's folding in and making that play, then I would want to have a front side release by the quarterback. And if he's insistent on getting his nose in there, then I will let that quarterback just carry the ball to the outside. Now, normally on counter, normally our rule on counter is that um, on power, we open to the play side and on counter, we open away with the ball fake. But again, if that guy is getting in there and getting nosy, I've got a solution for him. And of course I can always tighten down and now use my X as a, go from a two tight end set and I can run it uh, as well that way. And I can run it to the, to the, tight inside as well as long as my R is going to kick out that defensive end. I can do that too. So 
have options with it, but a GT counter would probably be something that I would look at. Now you can just run, um, if you don't, if you aren't worried about that, if you aren't worried about that, um, you could do some other misdirection plays, but you know, the base of the offense didn't have a ton of misdirection. Um, and so you could really, really key in on the H back. I've just got to have something. And I, I say the H back, it's the, the fullback. I've got to have something to take you away from the fullback. I, I really need, whether that's, whether that can be accomplished by play action to me, it doesn't get accomplished by play action. So, um, obviously if you're going to expand it and you're going to run an inside zone, you could just use him to kick out. Um, but I really think something to give another, to give an, a, a, a good play away from the fullback. And I think the GT counter is probably your best solution to that problem. So I mentioned that I was going to throw in one more play. Eventually it was just going to be the four. It was going to be power counter, uh, ISO, and the sweep as far as the run game. But I think I would be, uh, I would regret not mentioning the inside trap play. I do have a video on my YouTube channel. I think I also have an article maybe on running the inside trap play. Um, now the trap play, I would probably run mostly to a three tech, but since we've, we've been talking a lot of 30 front, cause we're back in the, the, the ancient ages here. Um, you can obviously do this no matter what front that you're seeing, you're just trapping the first man head up to outside of the guard. Some teams will trap a two eye. I've seen a lot of trapping of a two eye. If he's a big guy, trapping a two eye is no problem. And you can do that, uh, as well. But basically on the trap, uh, you've got everybody. Um, blocking back and you're pulling the guard. Uh, the, the, the backside guard is going to pull and kick the first guy head up to outside of your, um, the first guy head up to outside of your guard. Uh, really, really a great three tech play, a great even front play. You can trap a two eye as well. The, the fullback is going to take the handoff, um, opposite the play because this is really a tight and it's basically like a midline type of run here. So the quarterback is going to give him the midline. And he's just going to follow that guard. And this is where you can get some misdirection. The the good thing about this is, again, it's a feature offense where your feature back. You're going to get a little bit of misdirection. I don't like it as much against the 30 front, but against the 40 front, it's a fantastic play. But you're going to get some misdirection from your tailback because you can flare your tailback away. And everybody's living and dying by the best player in the county, uh, the best player in the conference if you're running that. And they're, you know, he's your feature and they know he's getting the ball 30 times. So they're keying on him and just get, get eyes looking, uh, away as much as you can, you know, get eyes looking, not worried about that. Get eyes looking away as much as you can. So it's a, again, these last two plays, the counter and the, um, inside trap are more about, can I get some sort of misdirection? Um, and what I would probably do is the big looping, you know, fake toss look, show the ball up real high and then hand it off underneath to the fullback. Can I get your eyes looking at someone at, 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 at a feature guy? Um, so they're constraint plays, I guess not really, but constraint plays are a little bit different. Um, you know, if you're going to keep their key breakers, that's the word I'm looking for. These are key breakers for you. So that's what you're gunning for on these. You know, you've got your ISO where you're not pulling the guard. Um, you know, so it's not hundred percent guard keys. So you've got a good mix here, a good rushing offense. All that we're going to need after that is a little passing. All right, let's finish it out with a little passing. Um, the, the basic thing we're going to talk about is a waggle pass. Okay. Simple, basic, again, I want to build a playbook, but I want it to be simple. I kind of went overboard in the, in the run section, right? I think we had five run plays. Um, I think we had uh, we had the toss, the ISO, uh, power, counter, and trap. And we can run power both ways. We can run ISO both ways. We can run toss both ways. Um, so we've got a pretty big playbook, honestly. And I might even cut that down to, again, um, 
a lot of people don't like this and I didn't like it at first, but running, especially early on, only running power to the tight end side, only running counter, uh, away from the tight end. Um, you know, only running ISO as best you can only running ISO to a, um, to a, to a white side, to an open B gap. Okay. Wide defensive end. Um, you know, if you get a bare front, you can't do that. You just want to be able to audible. If I got a bare front, I want to audible to the toss sweep as fast as I could, um, or potentially the power counter, depending on how good your down blockers are against their guys. And again, if you got, um, some stud linemen, then you're good to go. But the passing game, okay. A simple, fake off of like say the weak side iso right keying on the h back or maybe it's a fake off of your counter i guess it's it's a backfield action that looks like something that you actually run but the key is the h back is going to go to the throwing side and the and the tailback is going to go to the um to the fake side the key is not to get the defenders going the wrong direction as far as laterally. The key is to get the defenders going the wrong direction vertically. Okay. So if I can get these defenders sucked up, I'm going to have, if I can get the, the linebackers sucked up, I'm going to have the ability to complete this pass. Now, my ultimate is. Can I get the corner sucked up? And so remember I kept saying, screw the corners, don't block them. Okay, we're going to slide protect everything in the direction. Basic slide protection with the offensive linemen. They're all going to be sliding to the call. Okay, now what we usually do is counter away. So like if we were going to go counter to the, if we were going to go counter pass to the left, then we would be calling counter to the right. So 24 counter would be counter to the right, or we would call counter right pass. That means the offensive line slides away, the quarterback boots away, but the backfield is going to be doing their faking action. At least the R is going to be doing his faking action to the direction of the call. Uh, so he's faking 25 counter. Uh, and then we're, you know, that's the way that I would call this play. Uh, he's faking 25 counter, but again, the H back is going to be, or the fullback is going to be going opposite because he's going to leak out for us to have an extra receiver. But remember I said, screw the corners, go block the safety. Well, I cannot tell you how much value there is in this. Not so much in the fact that yes, it will benefit you by getting you some extra yardage down the field. And I think that's significant because when you get down the field and you get a block on a safety, some eight yard runs will turn into 12, 15 or break all the way. Um, or a, a backside pursuer guy, somebody in there, you'll get longer runs. I think it will increase your yards per carry much more than blocking the corner. But here's where it gets big. You run the ball 30 times, and every single time that you do it, other than if you run, um, yeah, every single time that you do it, he's going crashing down inside to the safety. Now, everything in the backfield looks like a run. All right, the corner, he goes crashing down inside. The coach is yelling at the corner because you've thrown the ball four times this game. So he's telling the corner to get involved in the run fits because he doesn't understand the umbrella and that as soon as he does that, does that we're going to smoke him. So we take the crack corner route with the receiver on the call on the on the pass side. So he's going to be um, if we're faking the run to the right and then we're we're waggling we're we're booting to the left. And I know waggle and bootleg, I'm probably using the wrong terms here. For us, it's just counter pass. I don't remember the distinction between waggle and bootleg. I've looked it up multiple times. I've probably even done a whole podcast about it, but I don't remember it because it doesn't matter to me. So he's going to come running down his side like he's going to go crack the safety. The corner sees that. He sees run field, run the backfield. So he's like, oh, here we go. I'm going to finally make the big tackle on the run game. Coach is going to be so proud of me. And then that receiver breaks it off after three or five steps, I think five steps is good, he breaks it off to the corner. Now, if you do this and you really commit to the run game and you really commit to blocking the safeties, you will get multiple times in the season, if not multiple times in a game, that guy wide open. And so the way that we read this, the quarterback is going to read deep to short. And so the first thing he does as he comes out of his fake 
and he runs his boot. Okay, as soon as he snaps his eyes around, his eyes are going to peak for that deep route. Now, we will only throw the deep route if one of two things happens. That crack corner route is wide open, uncovered. We will throw that. Or if the 16-year-old quarterback does what 16-year-olds do and just decides to go ahead and throw it anyway. Okay, so it's either he's wide open or he made a mistake. That's when you throw the crack corner route. So he, it's a peak. He just looks. Is that guy, do, do I see my guy wide open? <sighs> throw it to him. It's not a long throw. And I definitely don't want to wait for it to be open. I want to come around, bam, because I don't want a long throw because I'm on a run, right? I don't have, you know, especially depending on the direction of the quarterback. So we're usually going to run counter pass to the, um, it'll be like a 25. We're usually going to end up booting to the right. So that it's, I think it's easier for that quarterback to get his shoulders around and throw that ball. But some people don't, okay? And it's, sometimes just quarterback likes it. But um, that's the crack corner. On the other routes, you're going to get a drag from the Y. So we're going to run this again out of a pro with the Y set to the right. Uh, we're faking like it's essentially like it's counter. I mean, really, it's close. It's kind of like counter, um, but with everybody going the other way. Opposites. Um so we're faking to the right. That Y is going to step down like he's down blocking, but he's going to run a drag route and he's going to go under the first linebacker, over the second linebacker, looking for a spot on the sidelines. If he ran all the way to the sidelines, he would run out of bounds at 12 yards down the field. Okay, that's that's how I want the drag route to be run. So we have a deep route, we peak it, then we look to the intermediate route. If we've sucked up the inside linebacker or the safety, uh, then we should have in that hook curl area, basically over top of the tackle is where I want it to come open. If it comes open over top of the of the, of the the boot side tackle, the throwing side tackle, then we should have that thing wide open. The H back, again, is going opposite the direction of the R. So the he's, he's just going to step up uh, almost like it's ISO. And, you know, we're thinking that that inside linebacker is living and dying with him. So he's going to step up. I just need to get a step on him. And then we're going to run that to the flat. And that's going to complete kind of a flood concept or a triangle concept with a deep and intermediate and a short. If they do a great job of covering all that, then the quarterback now has the run option. Yeah, that's right. It's an RPO. The quarterback could run, uh, as most play actions are. So he's going to have the option to run if he wants to, if neither, if none of those are open. If none of those are open, it's a pretty good job by the defense. It wasn't set up very well. Uh, and by the way, it's just a one-yard shoot route by him, uh, just looking to get an athlete in space out there. You can obviously make lots of changes with that if you want to get the R out there. There's different things that you can do to get him out. And the backside, we've got a post. Okay, backside post is a box call. You don't throw the backside post because you never throw across the middle late. Too much happening. Watch football. Watch interceptions. Across the middle late. No. The backside post is a box call. All we say is the guy from the box says they're not defending. That free safety is jumping the drag. The free safety is jumping the drag. We say, all right. So coach goes to the quarterback and he says, Counter right pass. Check the post. Or you can say throw the post. We can make it an object route. We're just throwing it. Okay. Counter right pass. Check the post. Now what that's going to do is we're going to make the post our deep option. And the crack corner isn't going to matter. Okay. So we check the post. Expecting to come out. See the post wide open. And it's a home run ball. If we don't say that, he is not in the progression because we're going to be looking for the crack corner to the drag, to the shoot, to take off and get what you can get. Don't throw across the middle late. To me, that's basically what you need. You need that. that that's, that's going to be, you might have one other play action. You could put other play actions off of other routes and that's, that's no problem. Your other passing routes are basically going to be uh, in this in this simplified offense. Your hitches on the outside, okay, just a simple hitch on five step hitch. 
max protect it. You can have your tight end run a little pop and a straight drop back, three step drop by the quarterback. Keep your, you know, keep your fullback tailback in because they're not going to, you can flare them, I guess, but they're not going to help you too much. You might flare one of them to the, to the opposite side. You might have them both go, you know, whatever, but it's a three step. You're really just looking at all the corners off. If the corners press up or if you just want to take a shot, then instead you run the fade. Okay. So really what you're looking for is, are they giving me space on the outside? If they're giving me space on the outside, run the hitch. If they're giving me press on the outside, or I got a good matchup one-on-one, then I'm going to run the fade and I'm going to take a shot. And I'm going to use that a few times a game just to back you off, just to let you know that I'll do it. I'll take a shot. And if I take four shots and I complete one for for 22 yards, fade should be thrown 17, 22 yards down the field, not 35. Um, so if I fade 22 yards down the field, I complete I get a 22-yard completion. He's tackled immediately as he catches the ball. That's fine. I'm averaging 5.4, 5.25 yards per play that's as good as a run play i'm pretty good with it if i can't complete it if i'm going to complete it 20 percent of the time that's fine it's four yards carry type of thing that's not bad if i'm going to complete it one out of every eight times that's bad you know that's not good so i want to complete more than one of eight i want to complete at least one out of five i want to complete on the fade ball in order for it to be a successful play for me now the other thing is if i complete if I don't complete them, but I back the corners off to where I can throw hitches and looks, now we're in business. So really that's going to be the foundation of, because you're going to be such a run heavy offense and you're going to get good at just a few things. So the pro I offense still a viable offense. Obviously you can extend, expand it even more. Um, but gosh, don't, you know, don't, you don't need a ton of stuff. At least in your first year doing it. And again, I think that if you if you can guarantee that you're going to have a dynamic feature back, a how a powerhouse offensive line for her, you know, years to come, then that's great. If not, then I think getting into a system like the Pistol Power Offense system, where this can be a part, it could be the feature for a year. You know, I think that's a better uh, solution, but that's that's whatever do what you do what you do check out the pistol power offense system pistolpoweroffense.com and be sure to check out some of my other videos including other videos from this podcast and i've got a lot of other great coaching videos on this channel that you can check out that are shown down below here also if you want to subscribe make sure you don't miss any future videos just click on the logo on the top left of the screen